road she traveled. And our women who made a difference. Aquila Kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Sue Mercer, conducted on April 26th by Marissa. The YWCA, because um, I worked for the YWCA at the time. And so that was my, I, I took first place in Class C in the racquetball tournament okay. at the Y. So that was another, it's got a Y t-shirt on it and stuff. And then this, I picked up, it it's, turns out that they are in the process, New Horizons is in the process of trying to get their artifacts together oh, in some okay. kind of oh, neat. form. Um, and the only thing that I had remembered was this book. And this book was put together by the staff when I left in 1980. Um, it kind of started in 1978, and then in 1980, my husband and I left the cross and went down to the Caribbean. Okay. And so they, the staff put this together for me to take so I could remember you know, all the neat things we had done. And I had it for a couple of years and then I decided it really did belong with the mm -hmm. horizons. Mm -hmm. So I sent it back and my daughter took it over. So I went to borrow it. Oh great. Day. And this, this part just cracks me up. So I open it up, I haven't seen it for 25, 26 years. So I opened it up and it says, our beloved director, and there's no picture. <laughs> now I don't know if that was a judgment on somebody's <laughs> part or if my picture just disappeared. But they probably took it, it out to use it. Me. Yeah, that's right. And there's so and there's a couple other things in here that you might be able to see. The very first house. A lot of people know where it is now. But this was the very first one and it was on Jackson Street. It no longer exists. It got demolished for St. Francis parking or something. Um, and St. Francis allowed us to use that at no cost for a while. And then there's two other pictures that are houses. This was the second house and then this is the one that everybody knows. First we'd like you to say your name and then spell it out. Say first and last name and then spell it out. Okay, my name is Sue Mercer, S-U-E, that's pretty obvious. And Mercer is M-E-R-C-I-E-R. First question is, is there anything that's really like impossible for people to not know about you, like a trait or a quality that you have that pretty much everyone knows about? Something they do know about? Mm -hmm. but, hmm, that's an interesting question. <laughs> the first question already, you're making me think that. <laughs> um, that I'm doing my job. <laughs> that's right, I guess, yes. I guess most people know who know me at all know that I'm pretty outgoing. I'm, I'm not shy. Mm -hmm. Is that, that, yeah. Do you think that there's like any reason that this is a huge part of you? Well, probably because of the way I was raised. My parents um, were, were both very supportive and convinced my brother and I that we could do pretty much whatever we wanted to. And so I, I, believe that and, and I had have no reason to be shy. Okay. Um, you lived in many places as I found in research, like Taiwan and the Caribbean. What inspired you to move back to La Crosse? <laughs> um, I, my husband and I were living down in Florida and we were riding bicycle at six in the morning for exercise, which we did every morning, and he was hit and killed. And so I didn't really have any family or friends or anything down in Fort Lauderdale where we were. And La Crosse was where I had lived and where I knew people and my daughter lived here, so I moved back here at that point in 94. Okay. How did your time in like the other countries influence what you think of like the U.S. and like politics and minority rights and stuff like that? I think the time that I spent living in those places and also in the last two years, um, this last year I just spent three weeks in China and the year before that I spent three weeks in the Cook Islands which is down near New Zealand. And I think that traveling teaches me that um, people in some ways are all alike no matter where they live. We're all we're all pretty much alike. Um, and I also think it shows me that we're very lucky in the United States to have the freedoms and things that we do have and that we ought to be very protective to be sure we don't lose them. Okay, when did you join the League of Women Voters? 
I joined the League of Women Voters very pretty late in my career, uh, just about seven or eight years ago when I came back to La Crosse. When I lived in La Crosse before, um, I was a member of the Women's Political Caucus, which doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and I was a member of that because I thought they were more politically active than the League of Women Voters. Um, when I came back to town this time, I looked around and most of the women that I knew and admired were members of, of League, so that's when I joined. Okay. You talked about in an interview that I found that you think it's important for people to be educated and to get them to vote. Do you have any ideas how like this could happen? Not as many ideas as I should have. No, I just I think it's primarily a question of people be wanting to be educated, and I'm not sure that they do, um, and I'm not sure how you convince them that they should be. I think the way we run political conventions and political campaigns nowadays turn people off. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very short little snippets. They don't really tell you anything. A lot of the time they're very negative. And I think, if anything, that turns people off rather than educating them. And then, but then, if you look when we have, um, when we do have the debates and things, people don't watch anyway. So I'm not sure how you do it. Okay. And again, in research, I saw that you did a lot of work with the Women's Center and that you were the program director for the YWCA. Who influenced you to stand up so much to women's issues? Um, who influenced me? I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I got the job at the Y as a program director, and the women that I was dealing with there on staff and, and so forth were impressive women. and. We also, at that time, because the YM and the YW were in the same building, we did have some conflicts. And so it reminded me that somebody's got to stand up for the women. <laughs> <laughs> and it normally, unfortunately, is not going to be the men. So that's that was part of it, I think. Okay. In an interview I read that was in 1978, you said that there may be some needs that we haven't even dreamed of yet, referring to the New Horizons Women's Center. Um, since then, what have you encountered that you hadn't dreamed of, if anything? Well, that quote particularly was because we're, that was right in the beginning when we were just having introductory meetings with a bunch of women talking about what do we think is needed. Um, and the immediate need was for shelter for abused women. There were also some women in the group that thought we needed something like a women's art gallery and uh, women's co-op and those kinds of things. What happened was that the, we didn't have enough people and enough time and we spent all our time working with the abused women. So um, I don't think and we dreamed of anything more. I think we, it, was, it stayed right with the abused women because it was such a need. Okay. Um, did more people motivate you or discourage you from helping the women, like in the community? Um, I, probably about half and half. Um, the women obviously, most of the women were very supportive. Some of the men were not. When we first started in 78, most people didn't even know there was such a thing as domestic violence or physical abuse to women in marriages. So we had to do a lot of educating. And I was just telling somebody the other day, we used to go out and speak to groups uh, like the Rotary and, and the Lions Club and men's groups, um, explaining the need and why they should support what we were doing. And what happened was always there would be some men in the audience when you got done giving your speech that would say, well, but what about the men? The men get beat up too. And then you'd have to go through this whole thing to explain to them that the men had other resources. The men were normally the ones who had the jobs and made the money and, and could leave if they wanted to. They normally weren't in charge of the children. They were normally bigger. I mean, there were a lot of reasons that mm -hmm. Some men, I think, felt threatened, and I think sometimes they were men that were beating up their wives, let's be honest. Can you tell me a story about how people motivated or discouraged you, like to your face? Um, well, the, the 
men in the in the meetings was rather discouraging. How people how people motivate? I think the motivation probably came when when we first started with New Horizons and we had the first house that I showed you the pictures of. We didn't have any washers or dryers or any of that kind of thing, so I used to take the walk. And we had women right away, practically from the beginning, who came and needed some place to stay, and they usually had children and stuff. So along with my other job at the Y, I used to take the wash home and do the wash and bring it back. And then if I was doing cooking something at home, sometimes I'd make a great big huge casserole and take over there for them for dinner and stuff. And the women that were there were so appreciative that that would have been motivating because they were finally in a safe place where they didn't have to be afraid. Um, and they appreciated that and they let us know it. Were there like any obstacles in trying that would like hold you back from helping these women? Many, <laughs> many. When we first, the house that is now the office of New Horizons, the, what they call the annex, um, on the corner of West and the kind of on the corner. Um, when we first, we got well, a block grant, which was money that youth government used to give out. Um, and we got a block grant to buy a house and we found that house. And it was, uh, obviously it was close to the Y, so that was a good thing. And it was big and it was at a price that we could almost afford. Um, and the neighbors, when, when they found out, we tried to keep it quiet because you don't want people to know where a shelter is because mm -hmm. the men sometimes get crazy and want to come find their wives. Um, so we tried to keep it quiet, but we, the word did get out. And that a number of the neighbors in that neighborhood, we had a big meeting over at the Y because they were very upset by the idea that we were going to have this shelter there in town. Uh, right in their backyard and we got that's that whole thing not in my backyard it's a very good idea to have this but have it in somebody else's neighborhood I don't want it in my neighborhood um, and so that was that was discouraging we we got it there anyway but that people were not willing to allow something like that close to them because they somehow thought it was going to be downgrade their property values the YMCA or the WMCA, is that downtown? The YWCA yeah. has an office in town, yes. Okay. And, and you see the, the things that the, that was one of, they don't have a swimming pool or a gym yeah. or any of those things, but they have some programs like CASA, which is the taking care of abused children. Um, they've got, they, they run Galaxy, which is the gay and lesbian I don't know what the rest of the initials stand for, but it's it's support group for uh, gays and lesbians. Those are the kinds of things that the YW does, um, which if you think about it are completely different kinds of things. Yeah. The YWCA has a um, program once a year, well it's called Circle of Friends and you donate $100 and, and uh, the money goes to run some of these Y programs. And then once a year they have a women's luncheon normally, although sometimes it's a dinner, down at the lacrosse center and, and um, honor certain women in the community, somebody in, in the education area, somebody in the professions and so forth. Um, again, those are things that the YM is not going to do and I'm not putting down the YM but it's things that I think are important and that should be done for women. Um, and, and I think the YW has a very important role to play. It's just different from the YMs. Because the YM is more focused on sports. Exactly, and because that's abilities. the kind of thing that men are more interested in. And I'm interested in sports too. I mean, you saw my big trophy, my racquetball <laughs> trophy, right? <laughs> and I just went to the Y this morning for exercise class. I mean, I go to the Y M all the time, but um, it's too bad that the YW doesn't have have a higher profile and more people know about it, like you and your mom, and, and, and not realizing, you know, what the basic differences were. That was one of the reasons that they ended up splitting um, when they were both sharing that same building, because we used to get into real big, well, the YM wanted to take over the whole building. That was their goal, and they ended up doing it. Um, 
because the YW decided for the kinds of things they wanted to do, they didn't need a swimming pool and a gym and those kinds of things. Um, and we were doing, we were duplicating some programs. I mean, we were running exercise classes, they were running exercise classes. So it split apart, but, but um, it's an important organization and should get more support than it does, I think, personally. There's a lot, like YMCA doesn't that stand for like young men, something? Mm -hmm. And young then YW is... Christian Association. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And then YW is young, young women's Christian Association. Okay, that makes sense. Sure, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it says it right in the name. It says it all right in the name. The only, the only thing as far as the name is concerned um, that I've always, personally, have always had a little bit of a problem with um, well, two things nowadays, now that I'm at the advanced age I am. Young, I don't like that so much. <laughs> and, and the Christian part, I have nothing against the Christian, except that it seems to me that it makes it very specific, and yeah. it leaves out mm -hmm. a lot. And I don't think, they, I mean, they don't mean to do that, you know, but it, it does, just by the name, sounds like it's leaving out we older, mature folks and anybody who isn't a Christian. Yeah, like the atheists and yeah, all the other religions. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, uh, you know, all those people. Muslims. And we have a lot, the population of those is growing in the U.S. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the more inclusive we can be with those populations, the better off we are. But I think, again, what happened when you asked me way earlier about the traveling that I've done and living in other countries and stuff, I think if more people could do more of that, they'd be more open-minded to other, to different mm -hmm. people and differences. Um, but if you live all your life in La Crosse, Wisconsin, um, or some other town in the Midwest of an equal size and never get a chance to meet anybody that thinks much differently than you or that looks much differently than you. They kind, you're kind of scared of anybody that's different. Um, and that's where most, as far as I'm concerned, where most of the problems come from. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, we have a society that is like longing for world peace, but we can't have that if we shut others out. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, that causes nothing but problems. I mean, that's like, that's part of the, in some ways, that's some of the same thing with the whole immigration thing now. I spent my winters down in Arizona, and so a couple of weeks ago when they had all the big marches with the immigrants and, and so forth, Phoenix had one of the biggest marches in the whole country because they're all coming across the Mexican border. And those people down there get real upset. Um, I mean, they're shooting them coming across the border and stuff. Well, that's not the answer. But part of it is just because you look different, you know? Yeah. It's our background that makes you this way, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's a part, there's something that says it's safe to be like everybody else. You know, mm -hmm. and if you're out here somewhere, um, you got to get... You're free bait. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. So you have to just, I mean, it's like you asked me along somewhere earlier on about the trait of mind that people would... you got to stand up for yourself, and you got to believe in yourself, mm -hmm. and in that if you, you know, I'd like to be your friend, but if you choose not to be my friend, that's your problem. You know? <laughs> Look what you're exactly. Missing. You have no idea what you're missing. My problem is always, I don't even know what the latest clothing is, you know, <laughs> it's just, I have to ask my daughter, what was, I came back from Arizona with a jean jacket, which was, which had a high collar and long sleeves and kind of a waist with some, and she said, oh, mom, you're in style. I said, no kidding. I said, <laughs> um, what is like the greatest accomplishment that you've achieved in your life? I, my greatest accomplishment was my four children, but my second greatest accomplishment, <laughs> <laughs> my second greatest accomplishment was starting New Horizons um, back in the late 70s because I think there's a, there was a need and we convinced the community there was a need and the fact that it's still going in 2006 shows there was a need. So that was my greatest, in addition to my four children. <laughs> 
And then I remember when I was a lot younger, I went to the YWCA for daycare, but me and my mom, neither of us really knew what YWCA was for. The YWCA is Young Women's Christian Association, which is the women's equivalent, obviously, of the Young Men's Christian Association. And I think it's very important to have both. They serve different purposes. The YMCA um, has perfect. the swimming pool and the gym and physical activities and that's important. We need those things and I thoroughly endorse them. The YWCA has other programs directed towards uh, gays and lesbians, towards abused children, towards honoring women of stature in the community. Um, and they do the kinds of things that would not be done by the YMCA. So I think they both have a purpose. I don't personally I mean, I don't, I think women have always been viewed that way. Um, it's just more public now. I think that may be, there, yeah, exactly, there are, there are more, there are more outlets for it. I mean, I gather you can go to websites all over the place showing things that certainly wouldn't have been seen 10, 50, even 10 or 15 years ago. And I think that's degrading to women um, t to some extent. I'm not sure what you can do about that because I'm a firm believer in freedom of speech and, and um, I think that falls under that, unfortunately. I don't think we can start censoring because once we start censoring things, there's who knows where we're going to stop. And especially, again, <clears throat> with the current administration, if they had their way, we would censure a lot of things that I think need to be out in the public. So uh, I think it's unfortunate that those things happen, but trying to censor them would be much worse. Because we have a way of taking a good idea and doing way overkill. Oh, absolutely. And who? And then the problem, of course, is who's going to say, you know, We've what's gone too the far. good idea and what isn't. You know, where, who's going to say where the line is drawn? I mean, obviously, I could do a good job of it, um, but on that I'm being facetious. You don't, you don't want to start down that road because that can get real dangerous. Okay, um, just to wrap it up, with again with the women's issues, what do you see that we still need to like address with the women's issues? Oh my, <laughs> we don't have enough time. <laughs> Well, a couple of things. I think we have to obviously work very hard to try and get pay scale on an equal basis. I mean, women are, what, making about 70% of what men make at the same, on the same job. That would be one thing. Um, I think we have to be very, very alert to the idea that there are people in our society who are attempting to take over women's bodies in the reproductive rights area and to eliminate abortion and I think that would be a horrible thing. I don't think abortion is a good thing and I don't think anybody wants it but I think it has to be a choice. Um, and our current our current administration is attempting very hard to get rid of that. So that would be two things I can immediately come up with. Okay, and um, is there anything that you see that we've definitely improved on? Oh absolutely. Absolutely from back in, well, back in the olden days when I went to school, <laughs> to college and stuff, the idea was that you went to college in order to find a husband and, and you got a teaching certificate in case something happened to your husband that you would be able to support yourself. Um, and then you got married and then you had children and that was what was expected of you. Um, and I think the possibilities for women and girls nowadays are just so much more than they were back in my day. So we're definitely going in the right direction. We just have to start paying them an equal amount of... Because now women can have their own lives and not have their lives based on their husband's Absolutely lives. right. So that you can be self-supporting and that you don't need. Then you can want someone, but you don't need them. And 
that makes all the difference. That's one of the reasons that women in, end up in abusive situations, mm -hmm. because they need uh, somebody to take care of them, or they think they do. This podcast brought to you from La Crosse, Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.